Welcome to another edition of the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast. He is the legendino, Tim Vickery, who is in Rio as we speak. And he holding it all together from his base in North London with a Sweden badge on his left <laughs> sleeve is Dot and Adebayo. Yeah, let's leave Sweden out of it because I'm not holding it up just we, Well, myself. we can't leave Sweden out of it because Sweden are part of this story. Very good. Oh, I like it. I like it. As you know, the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast, we look at a, a match from the uh, football history, a, a classic match, hopefully, but certainly a match that is, uh, for one reason or another, uh, memorable. And we try and talk about it through the prism of what was going on around that time culturally uh, and musically, amongst other things. So the perfect guest to have on this edition of the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast, Tim, is somebody who knows their football and knows their music because the music of the time is just about to take a huge shift just as England meet Argentina. So we're talking about the 7th of June, 2002. Do you remember it? I do, yeah, I remember it well. Um, and uh, I'm interested in all perspectives on this because from my perspective, this is an epic encounter, but I think it was a crap game in a crap World Cup at a crap time. I did say that we needed somebody who knows their football and music, didn't I, to come and talk about this. Uh, so I clearly wasn't talking about you, Tim, was I? No, um, no. Uh, go on, introduce him. Well, the one and only. James Brown. No, not that you can't, you can't, you can, how can you say someone, can you introduce someone called James Brown and then say he's the one and only? For you know crying what, out to, loud. I've had to live with this forever because obviously, I mean, for a while I was number two behind the soul singer and then there was a, a hairdresser who was best friends with Kate Moss. So kind of was slipped out a number three, you know, so it's... Uh, well, I've Soul never, Brother number three is not a bad title yeah, to have never, in life, well, is it? Never been hang one on, hang on. You might remember that Clash song, 1977, flip side of Complete Control, where they said, no Elvis Beatles or the Rolling Stones in 1977. Yeah. And they got a couple of them right, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I think Elvis bit the dust in that year. So you, you get moved up eventually, but not today. James Brown, music writer, media mogul, uh, and Leeds football fan. Almost forgot to mention that one, James. Welcome to the programme. Yeah, I think that's my connection into this, the Leeds element, as well as having a vague memory of the early 2000s. Thanks. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to it. I know both of you from listening to you on the radio, Tim with uh, Paul and Andy on TalkSport, and you, Dutton, late at night, when you're about the only person I can sit in the car with driving after midnight. <laughs> well, you've done a lot for us as well, I'm sure. Um, Partly, you know, I came across you when we were at the NME and you were uh, the features editor there. Then you went on to be the editor of Loaded and launch your own publishing firm as well. And you stuck with the publishing theme because you've just come out with a new book, haven't you? Oh, I'm just writing. I'm just, I'm very, very, very late on the book. <laughs> so it's not finished. We can't get I'm writing about my career music magazines and then starting it's not finished at all. I mean, I, I keep wishing some I wake up and somebody just finished it for me. But it's it's about, I mean, I lived through the, the golden era, the last great period of, of, of print publishing. And uh, on top of that, it was a really exciting time between the late 80s and, and, the, and the start of the, of the 2000s, the, the, the new millennium. And that was my professional, you know, life from like, age 18 to like my early 30s it was it was spot on it was just an absolutely brilliant time to be a young person in Britain um there was never anything to struggle about writing we were never short of anything to write about at the enemy you see Tim James talks about those glory days the halcyon days of being young in Britain and Unfortunately, though, the music was just about to get shit, wasn't it? Or well, well, wasn't I it just? So. Oh, yeah, go on. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I was obviously I was away. I've been uh, 2002. I've been away for for eight years, and I remember coming back just after the World Cup. It was the first time I brought her indoors over, uh, and uh, it was the first time just listening to what was around, 
that I was now 37, you know, but it was the first time I thought I have absolutely no connection to anything of this. It just, just a shower of shite. Uh, and I, I, you know, I was away for all of this time, um, but I've never liked those, those new labor years. It all seemed to me to be built on hubris. You know, the idiots thought they'd, they'd, they'd eliminated the business cycle. And, you know, I'm not, not an economist, but I could see the crash happening could see it all coming and see that just the whole thing was just built on 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 credit and that that you know that this that this was this was going to end uh, and when i look at the music that was around then certainly the, the, the top 10 there's there's nothing worth saving is there was there was there anything decent going on i mean i missed all the brit pop era and i'm not a great fan really I, you know i think I saw the other day Noel Gallagher publishing his 20 favourite record, favourite albums, and there's nothing black in there. It's just, you know, for me, the greatest English music has always been, it started from a, from a base point of black America or Jamaica, and it's used that and it's gone off in other directions. And that's what I, one of the things I didn't like about Britpop, even Blur, you know, I know Damien later went on in different directions, but Blur for me were like... Um, you know, Madness without the Skull or Ian Jury without the Jazz or something, you know, and Oasis were these self-proclaimed Beatles, but without the R&B that, that, that the Beatles were. So I didn't really like the Britpop era, but at least I think I thought it was interesting. But what was around now, the, the, the June the 7th, 2002, there's nothing there to latch on to. Was there anything going on that was interesting? Well, you know, around that, when Mark, the producer, asked me about this period, I really struggled to remember. I had to kind of prompt myself, and then I in 2002, I was launching a magazine called Jack, which... Based on Jack Nicholson, or you meeting Jack Nicholson at a party, as I recall. I did. That's why we named it after, because yeah. we, 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 we had three projects on the go. One was buying Viz Comic, another was a men's magazine, which we called Jack, and I can't remember what the other one was. And we named them like this tunnels, the secret tunnels in the uh, Great Escape. And we came out of the party... It's a house party in Chelsea and Jack Nicholson walked in and then um, it was like, I said, Jack Nicholson's just walked in and, he, and he, his girlfriend went, no. I said, yes, look. And so she went down the kitchen, she came back, she said, it's Jack Nicholson. So I walked down there <laughs> and he was talking to my old boss who, who, who owns Condé Nast magazines with GQ and, uh, and Vogue and Tatler. And uh, he very kindly introduced me and made a big fuss of introducing me to Jack Nicholson and Lara Flynn Boyle, who was an actress who was his girlfriend at the time, turned to the hostess of the party, said, who's James? And she said, he's a genius. <laughs> it was like the best moment of my life. But that's why it was called Jack. But I agree with Tim. Where was that enemy in, say, 10 years before, in 1992? We never struggled to find a cover. And in Loaded, in, uh, you know, in 1994, 85, 95, we had... Frank Skinner, Prince Nassim, Gary Oldman, the people from Brookside, Roland Riveron, Jimmy White, you know, Vic and Bob. We never struggled to get covers. 2002, we were doing this magazine and it was really unusual in that one, there wasn't a, there wasn't a great amount of stimulating creative uh, co content or sounds coming out of the music scene and, and uh, probably the things that were still good were very, very mainstream. So at that time, that summer, about a month after this tournament finished, uh, Fat Boy Slim played a gig on uh, Brighton Beach. There were a quarter of a million people there and it was all covered. It was on the front page of the sun. I remember. So we were in a situation where somebody who kind of like four years before, five years before when he'd had that, that brilliant car record that he'd done, uh, the Funk's old brother, whatever, whatever that track was called. He was now on the mainstream. He was on the front of the sun, a double page spread, did a special of it. He was playing for a quarter of a million and, and it didn't feel like there was many people that we could, we didn't, we struggled to put people on the cover. I think Primal Scream were in the first issue of that magazine. But the two things that everybody was talking about at that time, that summer, was The Office and Phoenix Nights. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They they were the two cultural things that had flipped things over, and that people were excited about. And I remember going to see Peter Kay playing at um, the Hammersmith 
Odeon, the big, big theatre at Hammersmith. Packed it out for about seven nights. So Ricky Gervais, I mean, I think both those, he was just seen as a genius. Both of those programmes were probably just about to start their second series. They'd, they'd come out the autumn before, roughly. That's my, me that's my memory of it. And do, you, then, do you think, is, is, it, is it viable? I, I I've never thought about this before, but is it viable to see The Office as a kind of satire on the managerialism of New Labour? No, not at all. I think you've got a, a, a take on that that is, um, you know, it was really exciting in 1997. You've got, you go back three years to when I started Loaded. John Major made a speech about young men in Britain in danger of becoming a nation of yobs and slobs. Thatcherism had been in for so long and it, it lacked, it lacked energy. You know, if you remember back when they got rid of Thatcher, it wasn't up and coming people. It wasn't like somebody like Debbie Cameron deposed her. It was this old guard of people who, who, who no longer, her ex-ministers and her ministers, who no longer believed in her. And, and she was replaced by kind of, you know, what is seen as a safe pair of hands. And he was, you know, he was, I mean, now John Major sounds like a, 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 the voice of reason, but to me as a young, young gish man, you know, my kind of mid to late twenties around that time, it was just deadly. It was like, this is a gray situation. And so when, you know, when I just thought it was, when, when new Labour, when they put the word new in front of Labour and they got this guy and my dad warned me, looked like an estate agent. My dad was like very left, is very left. And, you know, when they suddenly had, you know, him doing headers with Kevin Keegan and, um, you know, having a sit down meeting with Mrs. Thatcher, I thought as a political move, it was very shrewd. They were very adept. What you said about the city, you know, uh, and the economic state that followed in the early 2000s. He went to the city. He made a he courted the city of London to say, don't worry, we're not going to, you know, introduce socialism. And, and, and well, exactly. When he, he said banks should not be regulated, you know, it just wrong on every major issue you could you could bring up. Yeah, so I don't think it was as bad as you remember, but. But at, 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 at street level, you had a situation where there was a genuine euphoria amongst young people because the first, you know, to, whether you like Oasis or not, you, for the first time, you've kind of got, you've got bands that were going into number one who were the best bands around. And, you know, when they played Nebworth, they were the biggest band in the world at that time in terms of playing live at that moment. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I, mi I missed, missed that time because it, yeah, it, it, it sounds like it was exciting. It was. Metallica and, and Oasis, Metallica and U2 were probably bigger in terms of the amount of T-shirts sold or, or gig tickets sold around the world. But U2, uh, Oasis was selling records so quickly and there was such a sense of excitement. I went to Main Road to see them. And I didn't go backstage and all that. I just got a couple of tickets, went in the uh, crowd. I was surrounded by kids, teenagers singing. The whole of the pitch was full of kids singing. It sounded like one of those scenes in A Taste of Honey with Rita Tushingham. You know, just these Mancunian kids singing all the lines. And, and you know, I think it's 25 years or something. I saw some things on Instagram earlier, people put in some posters that they've put up of the lines, they were instantly recognisable. And, you know, things like, um, what's the worth, what's the point of looking for a job when there's nothing worth working for? Or looking, so, you know, he was writing lines about, you know, the resentment uh, uh, and, and that people had felt of that generation who felt excluded. And, but at the same time, what you're saying about can I like black music and dance music, that was all thriving as well. But yeah. it wasn't important for it to be in the charts. We need to talk about football, and we'll yeah, come back to the about two thousands. We're really we're, yeah, we're exactly no. Football. We'll come back to the charts. We'll come back to the charts, uh, and we'll come back to the cultural, uh, uh, you know, uh, scenario that they were facing at the time. But we need to talk about the football. So it's the seventh of June, two thousand and two. Argentina versus England in the World Cup. Do you want to set the scene for us, Tim? Well. The best interview I've ever done from an informative point of view was straight after this World Cup with the physical preparation guy of Brazil. And it was just fucking brilliant. It's a brilliant interview. Because he said, we knew 
going into this World Cup, the, the side that organised its physical preparation and uh, uh, best would win would win the tournament, because this was a World Cup that was held earlier than usual to avoid the rainy season in Japan and South Korea. So it started at the end of May, uh, and uh, the the Champions League had been expanded. So there were two group stages of the Champions League. So the European based players had played a harder, longer season and had less time to recover from it. And that's one of the reasons this was such a dreadful, dreadful World Cup, that everyone who played the European season, with exception from, of, of Brazil, were like physically on their knees. It's why there were so many, so many upsets. You know, in, uh, a Germany side who, by their own admission, were dreadful, nearly won it. Now, they gave Brazil problems in the final, nearly won it. Turkey and South Korea, I know South Korea had home advantage, but Turkey, how many times have they qualified for the World Cup before or since? And USA thrashing Portugal in the USA. This was, this was way before the USA were, 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 were challengers, but their, their players were much, much fresher. Uh, and, uh, and Brazil won it. They had some individual talent, but Brazil very nearly didn't qualify. They were in absolute turmoil before the World Cup. But come the occasion, they got their players fit because they were better at getting their players fit. The Brazilian economy had opened, opened up in the mid-90s and, and they'd been able to import sophisticated equipment from the United States and they could draw up individual training programs and it's one of those things where your domestic weakness um, forces you to be creative because European football had money so I mean, the, the, this guy Paolo Pachon the physical prepara preparation specialist said you know I went to visit Juninho at Middlesbrough and I just couldn't believe how many players there were in the treatment room not playing and Juninho told me well they don't care they just go out and buy another one you know, in Brazilian football, you couldn't do that. The calendar is, is, is so crowded. There are lots of games. Uh, and if you've got a big name player earning big money, he has got to play them. So they had, they, they had worked up methods of getting their players physically fit in difficult, in, in difficult circumstances. Uh, and they really put that to bear in the World Cup. I mean, Inter Milan couldn't get Ronaldo fit. And uh, the Brazilian guy, he said, you know, we looked at what Inter Milan were doing and we thought it was shit. Leave him with us. We'll get him fit. He won the World Cup. Barcelona said Rivaldo couldn't play the World Cup. Leave him with us. We'll get him fit. We did it. And they drew up individual training programs for, every, for all of their players. Eased off at the right moment. They played a, 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 a joke warm-up game against Malaysia a week before their, their, their debut. And then they eased off. France, who was a side that they most feared, played a high-profile friendly against South Korea four or five days before their debut and lost Zidane. Zidane came back for the third game when they were in trouble on one leg. Um, the favourites from that World Cup were all absolutely physically out on their knees. And the big two favourites were, were, were France and Argentina. Uh, and France didn't score a goal. Argentina, who I'd seen a lot of in qualification, under Bielsa, it's Bielsa really making his name. They were a terrific side. They had South American talent and European dynamism. And they were a wonderful side. But it is... Bielsa's method of play, it absolutely requires you to be operating at full tilt the whole time. And uh, they came to that World Cup physically just unable to do what they'd done in qualification. They couldn't do it. They beat Nigeria. They always seem to beat Nigeria, apart from the 1996. It pisses Olympics. me off so much. You can't believe it. They always beat Nigeria in the same flipping way. Like the bloke in the offy uh, opposite me when I was living out in my brother's flat near the Guna Stadium, um, for those who know it. He used to say to me, um, I came down when they beat us in, was it 94 they beat us the first time, Argentina? Yeah, yeah. 94, and they beat 94. us from a corner or whatever it was, and Batistuta had something to do with it, as I recall. And I went out to the office to drown my sorrows, and the Greek bloke who ran the office said, why, why, he said, you're Nigerian, aren't you? And I wanted to say no, actually. I was going to say no, because the game had just finished. And he said, you're Nigerian, and he had his telly up in the office, and he said, you're Nigerian, aren't you? Why didn't you Nigerians, because we were leading, initially he said why didn't you Nigeria just put 11 men in front of the goal like that would have stopped it but I thought yeah he's got a point the corner that they took and they did it at the same time because I think the second time around it was from a free kick when they beat us in the it was Maradona and Kanija it was Maradona's oh, last right. last okay. uh last game he tested yeah. positive uh, yeah. a little a quick little free kick and Kanija's away and, and Nigeria's they've just switched off at the wrong time well it's our defense was hopeless in both those situations is what I remember anyway that's another side issue so they, they've beaten, Argentina have beaten Nigeria. 
England, I think England and Sweden was probably the dullest of, of the dull. And then you've got the game. And, and what makes this epic is Beckham's comeback and all the rest of it. And you, the pair of you who are in England, you'll be able to do that far, far better than I was. But it was Bielsa's Argentina looking to roll over everyone. That's what they were. They, they, they just played in your half of the field. They, they, they created two against one situation down the flanks. And they looked they look to, to have a stranglehold on you in your own half of the field. And they just, they, they done it for, 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 for two years. They just breezed through World Cup, qualify, World Cup qualification. But come the big event, they dominated most of the game against England. England did them on a counter-attack. A lot of the second half is attack versus defence. The third game against Sweden that they had to win, they dominated that, but went, went down to a free kick uh, and, uh, and tried and tried and tried and dominated the game, but without creating enough chances because they just didn't have that nip about them. And I felt very, very sorry for them. You know, I'd, I'd been down to Argentina just before the World Cup. Uh, and uh, it was a moment when the country had absolutely collapsed. Uh, up until a few months before, it was in the Constitution that one peso, peso was one dollar. And which had obviously put, put you know, Argentina's goods uh, on, a, on a level where they couldn't sell anything on the open market and inevitably it collapsed. And the, the, just the country had entirely collapsed. Anyone who could move out was moving out. They were, they were, they were trying, to, trying to emigrate and trying to get away. And I was there to like two or three weeks before the World Cup and it was pissing down with rain. And there were only two activities keeping Argentina afloat, buying dollars and selling umbrellas. That's the only two things that the country was doing, you know, and it really needed that World Cup as a morale boost. I really thought you were going to say football. Say that again? Sorry, James. I really thought you were going to say football then. I thought football was keeping them going. Well, yeah. Well, all right. Three, three things keeping Argentina going. Buying dollars, selling umbrellas, and dreaming about winning the World Cup. <clears throat> uh, and uh, that, that third leg of the peg it just got kicked cruelly away starting with this game against England yeah well the the Leeds connection is obvious here for those who don't know uh, not amongst the players but certainly amongst the uh, the backroom staff but James you must be loving the opportunity to talk about how Leeds United beat England in this match yeah I mean well, well, Leeds United beat England. Yeah, Leeds United versus Sven and Eriksson representing England. Uh, Leeds United beat England, didn't they? Yeah, I mean, well, actually, I mean, Leeds had half of the defence done. <laughs> the England defence was Danny Mills and, and, and Rio Ferdinand. Fair point. Fair point. But you know, David somebody... Seaman's a Yorkshire lad as well, isn't he? Yeah, and uh, well, no, David Seaman was, a, when I was at school, David Seaman was playing for Leeds because my mate was one of the other keepers. As, as kids there and um, he never played for the first team I don't think and he, he, he went off to QPR somewhere but Nigel Martin and was not long since gone from, from Leeds a couple of years before he joined Everton so but something really interesting happened just before that World Cup which was almost a li like a little uh, spark not a good spark about Two weeks before they started, when they were away, when the players were off on their warm-up, maybe even in Japan, there was a tiny story, a news in brief, in one of the papers, one of the broadsheets. And it said something about Manchester United being interested in Rio Ferdinand. Mm. And, I mean, it was two sentences. You know, at the end of those kind of things, and they just have a little bit. And I thought, what's all that about? Leeds have just finished fifth. So we haven't qualified for the Champions League. But I actually think, at the, I, I, mean, I mean, I might be wrong on this, but I think 2001, I mean, this is a straw, a grass bat. On, on the calendar year, we finished first. The second half of the, of the 2000 and 2001 season, and then the first half of the 2001, 2002, we're the most consistent team. And if, if that's the thing, We've, we've won the league, but we finished fifth and everybody knows what happens came after. But the first sign that there was a problem was this little, this two sentence line that, that Manchester United interested in Rio Ferdinand. And I kind of thought, is that, is there anything in that? And I was kind of working with the club at that time, doing their publishing for them. And um, 
what made me think it was true was the way Peter Ridsdale reacted because Peter loved to be the center of attention. Being the center of attention was more important, I felt, in his life than actually doing the job right. And he was the chairman at the time, was he? Yeah, he was the chairman at the time. He was the guy that had given David O'Leary all the money to buy all the strikers we didn't need. And he made a big song and dance about denying it. And I thought, if that wasn't true, you know, just ignored it. It wasn't like it was a headline splash on the on the back of the, the mail or the mirror or the sun. It was two lines, the bottom of the Times or the Guardian. And then um, that was the start of it. That was the start of the House of Cards collapsing. Five more points, two wins. We finish fourth. We're in the Champions League again. We've done very well in Europe the previous three years, two or three years. And but we didn't, he missed out. And, um, and actually, you know, there were games in that first, Rio was an important person for Leeds at that time because he was smart guy. He was, he looked good. He carried himself well. He was a very good player, but this was the season that followed the season where there'd been the, you know, the, the, the street brawl that had involved some other players. Now, in that, Lee Boyer was cleared. People often forget that. He was cleared of any, uh, you know, punishable involvement in it. And, but there was this kind of like cloud over the club about racism. If you got to the bottom of what that fight was about, for me, having spoken to people who were there, it wasn't about race. It was started with some, some boys throwing ice cubes into the VIP lounge and it turned into a fight. It happened that one side had like mainly white footballers and the other side were young Asian lads. And that's as I understand what happened. Um, but so Rio was seen as very much a role model of, of, of what a good modern professional was. And he was important at Leeds. But he'd had a few games at the, in the second half of that season, which hadn't been great. And I remember thinking there were the times when he'd made mistakes that, I was thinking no one's criticising him because his importance to the way the club and the team need to be presented. I actually thought Jonathan Woodgate was a better player than, than, than Rio, but, uh, you know, his career kind of, at that point, at Leeds, fell apart with the trial. Um, so that was, I mean, I didn't want Rio to leave. I didn't want any of those players to leave. So, so that's where we were going into it. Gary Neville wasn't at the World Cup, so um, Danny Mills was playing right back. And I didn't even think he was the best right back at Leeds. To me, Gary Kelly was a much better player. Um, so they were they were in the midst of it. I'm going to hold my hand up. When, when um, Bielsa joined Leeds, I didn't know anything about him. You know, I'm not of, I'm not of the era that grew up playing computer games, obsessed with stats, uh, knowing the insides and the outsides of who was doing what. I like football for the emotion it stirs in me. I don't remember a lot of the great games. I remember incidents within the, within the games or where I am or, you know, it's a very, for me, it's a very emotive experience. So when you look back now at this guy who's just been a shaft of brilliant light onto our club doing other things, it's really intriguing. It's almost like seeing old photographs of women, you know, or men you're now going out with. You know, you see a different time of their lives before you knew them. And I, I, um, I discovered him. It was it was in '99. I discovered him when he was, uh, okay. he was coach of Argent, uh, coach of Argentina. Uh, and I've told this story many times, so apologies for those who've heard it before. Um, but the first time I went to one of his press conferences, it was a game in the Copa America in '99. His side had just lost three 0 to Colombia. His centre forward Martin Palermo had missed three penalties, and he himself had been sent off. Uh, and uh, so it was a fiery game. And you go into the press conference and in the, in the, the style that uh, you've all known to, to love, he's just staring at space, unable to make eye contact with anyone. Speaking in this extremely florid Spanish, he will never, ever learn another language, I don't think, because you can't translate. How, do you, how on earth do you translate the way that he thinks? Uh, and one of the first questions is, uh, uh, Marcelo, what did you make of the referee? And he starts, he says, uh, well, one doesn't have the habit of 
commenting on the uh, the activities of the match day officials. But now at this point, everyone's going to thinking he's going to say well, this 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 joker should never be let loose with a whistle ever again. Instead of which, he said, uh, "But I would like to say that with respect to my expulsion, the referee was entirely correct because I protested in an ill-mannered form." And you're thinking, oh, yes, bring this on. This is different. This is fantastic. And this is one of the great things about Bielsa. He loves blaming himself in a, in a, in a profession that is so insecure. And he did it the other day about a, a, a substitution that he made. Yeah, you know, I took off, uh, I took off um, uh, Rodrigo. I was wrong. It was a mistake. I shouldn't have done it. It was a, it was a wrong decision. I should have taken off Bamford. Uh, and he, he loves blaming himself and criticising himself. You know what, Tim? at the heart of his success and his popularity at Leeds. And, and that now goes beyond the club. Other people who don't have an axe to grind with, 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 with Leeds like him and are excited and intrigued by him. Is that just, he's a good guy. I don't mean he says a few good things and he signs a few autographs. He does all of that, but you just, he doesn't slag the opposition off. He doesn't slag the referee off. He doesn't make excuses. He will take the blame when it's not his responsibility. And he conducts himself in a way that is, you know, he's just not like a football manager. He's, he's like a priest or something. He's like Don Camilo, you know. The, That's what he is. He's, he's like a, a cross between a priest and a Pied Piper. He's, uh, he's, he's an extraordinary he's, figure. He's from Rosario, which is where Messi's from. Rosario, I'm sure you've been there. And also Che Guevara's there, from there. And in a way, I think he sits between there. Messi and Che Guevara. I like it. I, mean, he's, he's I, I, see, I, I tend to see him as a one-off. And, and, yeah. and, not, and I'll explain this. I mean, it, it's too simple to say he's just a product of Rosario or Argentina. Firstly... He's from a, a family of very illustrious lawyers. Mm. And, and th th that means he does carry himself with a little bit of, you know, I'm above all this. Uh, and in a, in a very insecure area, that makes him stick out. But there's a crucial part in his development that uh, a lot of people overlook. And that's he, he started as a coach in Argentina with his beloved Newell's old boys, mm -hmm. um, having NOB on his back, which always makes me laugh. Uh, and... Uh, he then he spent a few years in the 90s in Mexico. He coached a couple of clubs in Mexico. And it took him out of that Argentine, Argentine win at all costs mentality. Yeah. He just loved the mentality in Mexico where it was, it was a bit less full on with the football. And the, the period that he spent in Mexico, for me, it's, it's, that, it's equivalent to like when you go away to college. You come back a different person but more your own person. And I think that's, that, that's what, that's what happened, happened to Bielsa. I think that, that time in Mexico is crucial to understanding that he doesn't mind if he loses his way, but he's going to do it his way. The bizarre thing for me about the, 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 the Bielsa thing with Leeds, and I'm delighted that all you lot have, 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 have come into my little secret that I've, uh, that, that I've, I've had, that had for all these years, is that the association, please don't get offended, but the association that I have with Leeds, I went up to the FA Cup semi-final in 87. Which is Spurs? Tot Tottenham, yeah. Um, but I was, this was Co I was at college in Coventry. And 87, okay. it was a big semi-final. Coventry yeah. and Leeds on a Sunday morning. It was the biggest police operation there had ever been for a game because of Leeds. That's why I was at Hillsborough, because there was less distance for the Leeds fan to travel. Uh, and uh, we all hired a minibus and went up the M went up the, the motorway, and loads of Leeds fans had come down, purely and simply to give racist abuse to Coventry fans going 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 up to the game. You got a team full of N words. We heard again and again and again, and that was the association that I always had with Leeds. And now everyone loves them. Yeah, I mean, do you think, I mean, do you think yeah, that, that Bielsa's goodness, his niceness, his, his correctness will have a long-term effect on the culture of the club? Well, before you get to that point, before you get to that point, the irony about Leeds fans is that for years they were chanting the name of David Uluwale, weren't they? Who was a homeless guy who was, some people say, um, well, he was killed in police custody, let's put it that way, and 
yeah. uh, what's emerged from the book about him. <clears throat> um, I did an interview with the author of the book about right. uh, the death of David Uluwale. And what emerged from that was there was a racist policeman or a couple of racist policemen who were kicking him around for years, years, and he died in their custody. I mean, the, when Howard Wilkinson came, he was, you know, the first thing, one of the very first things he did, he went out onto the pitch and made statements about it, about us being inclusive. And he, you know, he signed a lot of black play players, you know, and it was, I mean, the last time I, I, went, I stopped going for a while when I moved to London to write for the NME. The last time I went in about 1985, we were playing Oxford. Um, the team wasn't that great. There's a striker called Tommy Wright scored. We won one nil, I think. And um, the South Stand was just full of kind of casuals, hissing, you know, like gas and singing anti-Spurs songs and uh, anti-Yids and all that sort of thing. And uh, um, it wasn't, wasn't a good time either. You sported Leeds team, you know, if you cared about that sort of thing, about racism and, you know, kind of social issues, it wasn't a nice place to be. But I think you're right. Now, people like Leeds, you know, they like Leeds, they like Bielsa. You watch that game that, that we played against Liverpool three weeks ago. If we'd had the centre-backs that we had for the whole of last season, I think every game of last season, almost to the end, but actually most of the game, we, we had somebody different at the very beginning, but Cooper and White, Cooper was uh, injured after playing for Scotland a few weeks ago, and White has returned to Brighton, who owned him. So we had two defenders there. One's come Robin Kosh, Koch, Kosh, whatever his name is. Mm, he's he's joined... He's, he's arrived in Leeds three days before. He's probably not even packed his, unpacked his bags. He's come back from German international duty. He's signed. It's surely uh, fitting that, that, that Cock plays for a, a manager who started with Nob. Yeah. Sure. I knew yeah. you were going to go there. I knew Perfect. you were going to go there. I couldn't resist anything then, apart from tempt temptation. It's, uh, and the yeah. other boy, Stroik, he's an under 23. It's his fourth appearance for the team, and two of them have been in uh, defensive central midfield filling in for Phillips. So you've got two total novices there. And we were playing the level of strike force we haven't seen for 20 years at Liverpool. And we went out, Leeds went out and played against Liverpool in the same way as we would have played last year against Fulham or Preston or anybody, you know? There was no, it, there wasn't disrespect, but there was no awe. We no, you lot should have won it. You lot should have won it. And you lot should have won it. You, you, you were the better team on the day, in my view. And the interesting thing in the post-match commentary, your manager Marcelo Bielsa, through his interpreter, was so gutted about what should have been seen as a really outstanding performance. He was gutted. You know, he, great, great performance. We didn't get the result. We didn't get a result out of it. And he was so gutted. I thought, yeah, you've got a proper manager there who's a baller. You'll, you'll who, be even more gutted if Ipswich get promoted, won't he? You'll have to try and say the name again. It's one of my favourite <laughs> moments. But let's not lose sight that we're talking about the 7th of June, 2002. So as I was trying to say earlier, Marcelo Bielsa representing Argentina as a coach versus Sven Juran Eriksson representing yeah. England, albeit a Swedish coach. Is it a game of tacticians or is it a game? I know that various um, notorious incidents on the pitch were down to the players, but in terms of the way that the team set up, was there something in, it was a, a manager's game, essentially, or not? Yeah, the Argentina proposing the game and, and England reacting. And it, and it did for England in the end, didn't it? In the, was in that, that the World tactic, Cup. though, from yeah, yeah, Argentina? Yeah. That was their tactic? Oh, yeah. The playing, playing your half of the field and squeeze them. And, and England were quite happy to be there. You know, England, they had a, a striker, Michael Owen, who and he, he would score goals when he was the only England player in the opposing half of the field. Yeah. Um, and what a centre-back combination. You can, you can defend that way close to your own goal if you've got defenders of the calibre of, of Sol Campbell and Rio Ferdinand together. And and Seaman behind was a was, so they restricted yeah, our, our, yeah. Argentina. Go on, James. I can put in there on Seaman. I don't think Seaman was the best keeper in Britain at that time in England. And this isn't club related; it's club influenced. 
But I think Martin was better. I mean, if you talk to Everton fans, they say, well, at the time they were going, why have you sold Nigel Martin? He's amazing. He's the, by far the best keeper we've had since South Hall. He's absolutely brilliant. And I, I just think we were in that little bit of situation that England invariably has of, of not letting the long-term uh, representatives go early, you know, probably when they should do. At club level, people are, are kind of moved out quicker. And I think Martin should have been in goals then. I, I, I do think Seaman was... And you saw that when, when Aldinho hit the long ball, you know, there were... Yeah. I, I think he was just more alert. I think he was sharper and more alert. And like I said, I think he'd left Leeds 18 months before, maybe, you know, a year or so before. And it was... It was it was the the response of Everton fans to me that maybe they God he's getting even better as he gets on you know and so that that, that was possibly a, a I mean Seaman was a great great keeper there's no doubt about that and a great character as well uh, probably a great guy to have at the back of your defence but I think he should have yeah I, I think that would have slightly improved the team. There. He did like a bit of McDonald's, as I uh, as I can attest to, having bumped into him in a Mickey D's many years ago. But the result was 1-0 to England. Beckham scored the goal. It was from a penalty. Uh, in today's game, would that penalty have been given? Yeah. A few years earlier, maybe not. It, it's a, it's a, it's a, there isn't, there's very little contact. But Owen was cute when they Pochettino just puts out a leg and Owen... Owen, Owen is cute enough. Like the great play, you know, things are happening at a. For him, it's slowed down. For for someone who's overwhelmed, everything's happening too quickly. So he sees the chance and he and he and he goes it's for the it. Momentum thing, isn't it? It's that it's that. Owen was such a pacey runner. He was so, you know, he could dart, but he could also build up pace over a period of time. So he was. At the moment, somebody like that, it's like Sterling. Now, anybody gets into the box who is. Who is that fast? It, it, you know, anybody challenging them is is, is walking a tightrope as to whether they'll give a pen away or not because they've gone. It's like when I play with, I play with sometimes play with guys in the late teens, early twenties. They've gone. You have to go. I'm really sorry. You went. <laughs> you know, when I was putting that tackle in, and you know, a year ago, you were there. By the time I arrived, you'd gone. It wasn't. If I try to foul you, I would have like. Yeah, it'd have been a different move, and I think. We forget that about Michael Owen because his kind of career slowed down after his injuries and his club choices, but he was so fast. And um, I, I don't know what you think about this, Tim, as well, is that this was the time when they played Heskey a lot because... Yeah, I was, was just good. about to talk about that. I was just about to bring that in. Yeah, he was good for Owen, but he was, you know, you look, for me, I look at the team, like certainly at club level and previously with Sheringham, Sheringham... And Fowler, for me, much better strikers than Heskey. So it was well, interesting. But, that... but when Heskey was at Leicester, when they used him as a proper centre forward, he was amazing. That's why he got signed to Liverpool as a result of that. When they used him in his natural role, which is as a number nine, he could do no wrong. I thought he was one of the smoothest centre forwards in the league at the time. But then when Liverpool started using him as sort of protection for Michael Owen and England started using him in that way, he was off centre slightly for me, you know. No comment. Well, I'm, I'm right, obviously. I'm yeah, just, we, I was trying to remember his time the there. He was under Michael, uh, Martin O'Neill, wasn't it? And they had the good cup run. See, I just, for me, when you look at that period, the, the player that I wish had had a much more successful England career is Robbie Fowler. He was and decent. He was decent. He was no, I think he was beyond decent. I think he was, he's one of the best strikers I've ever seen. He played for Leeds for about 15 games when, you know, Rich Dallas and Leary had been on a massive shopping spend. Mm. And or maybe he played a little bit more. I watched him play against Leicester. We hammered them 6-1. By the end of the game, Alan Smith, who was 19 or 20 at the time, was the captain. He was a good player, proper player. But Fowler was just, he was so sharp. That's why I remember his... His ability to hit the ball in all different ways, to finish the lob, cutting it, curling it. He was, for me, had he come at a different time, he would have had 40, 50, 60 caps. And I think what's interesting, if you look at that, that squad at the time, it's just not... It, Sheringham's still in there. 
But Shearer's gone. Les Ferdinand's no longer around. Uh, Chris Sutton isn't around. Andy Cole is there. But Andy Cole's another one like Fowler, who both of those guys should have had 40, 50, 60 caps for England and, and almost as many goals. You know, they were they were brilliant at club level as, as, as finishers. And, um, you know, but Tim started off by saying it was quite a, you know, a dull period for England and a bad com- competition. And I think you look at that team and it, it just, for, for me, it lacks some magic, really, I think. I wonder if, because it was a few months after we beat the Germans away 5-1, and I think in the long term, that result was better for Germany than it was for England. Because it, it, that game buried the German thing of playing a sweeper behind the defensive line. Because in that game, you, it, all you're doing is, is allowing the likes of Michael Owen and so to be onside if, he's, if, if, he, if, if the sweeper's so far back. So Germany, after that game, they thought, well, we're going to have, finally, we're going to have to learn how to play a back four. So I think that that, that that defeat is important for Germany. From the point of view of England, I wonder, and you know, I wasn't around for this, but I wonder if Sven was just too cautious. If that 5 1 uh, got him obsessed with the idea of playing deep and just trying to get one striker behind the line. And it's what Owen did against, against Argentina. It's what Owen did against Brazil in the quarter final, where, uh, you know, I think he, he might have been the only England player in the Brazil half and he took advantage of a mistake from Lucio and England go 1 0 up. But it's just. I, you know, I'm listening to, to James talking about the idea of Fowler and Owen together, higher up the field, more. Do you, do you think, this is more for Dotton, really, with the Swedish mentality. Do you think that Sven was a, was a good fit for England or was he too cautious, too passive? Well, you could see what he had done in Italy. He was always, I mean, he showed passion, but actually, if, if you looked at his tactics on the pitch, he was always cautious. And it is part of the Swedish uh, cultural psyche when it comes to football I mean there, there was a point I, I told you last time I spoke about this when I was playing you know just like amateur football in Sweden that you know they would kick you properly in the shins but it wasn't in the kind of a, a South American way to gain an advantage or something like that it was more to say no this is how we do things in Sweden you try to pass me I will kick you in the shins and you will learn a good lesson we're Swedish. So it's a Swedish version of Montel Jordan this is, this is how we do it. <laughs> you know, with, I can't I think, quite do it as well as you. With, I, I think if you've got, you make a fair point, and I don't think it's unique to Sven. I think all England managers become a little bit reserved and they lack fire when we get to the tournament level. I think we're seeing it at the moment with Southgate, possibly. Uh, certainly Roy Hodgson, when we went to that World Cup, you know, didn't, didn't put in Delph, Wilshire. Barkley, who all could have been playing, kept stayed stayed with uh, Rooney, moved him back to the midfield. But I think if you go back to what you're saying about Sven, you know, he was making his name in the like, 93, 94 with the Sampdoria team. They had Viali, Hollett, Platt, Mancini. And, and that England team didn't really have that mix of players, I don't think. I know, you know, I mean, Nicky Butt was man of the match in that game. <laughs> You know, it tells you a lot about the game, doesn't it? I, 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 this morning I read one report of the game, and they were they were amazed that Nicky buttered it a very good forty yard ball. Um, but you know, Skull, I think Skulls was man of the match actually in the report I read. But I just, or maybe he was given man of the match by, by whoever decided the official man of the match. But you know, I just there was there was it was a period for England when we, you know we we lacked. Spark. I used to really love Joe Cole for England, you know, and he was on the bench for that too game. Maverick, but he was too Maverick, wasn't he? Yeah, but we don't. I mean, you know, this is an old discussion. But one thing you ask about whether Sven was a good fit for England. One thing that he did that I thought was good was when he arrived in his very first squad. He had Chris Powell, yeah, who was yeah. the Charlton left back, and nobody had ever thought about giving Chris Powell a game for England or ever. I mean, you're, I don't, you're I'm speaking the, Dotton's language here. Well, That's you it. are, partly because I saw Chris Powell play several times in that season. I actually think he belonged in that team, and it was, you know... Yeah, very... no, well, that's my point, is that oh, yeah. if you go back to when Hoddle was manager, and I think possibly before that, we had two tournaments. We got knocked out of two tournaments in games when we were playing Phil Neville at left-back. 
and there was a there was a there was a guy who played for Aston Villa called Alan Wright, who was a really good left back. He was the he was when Aston Villa were under John Gregory when they were finishing second and third in the league, mm-hmm. and he was like the best left back, the best English left back in the country. But he wasn't seen as an England type player, and that's what Sven did when he first of all he picked uh, Powell, and then he picked Darius Fassell, who mm-hmm. I don't think ever kind of maybe got to the level of of a similar player, maybe like. That that was a more strange one though. I thought I could never quite get the derives of himself. No, I don't think he was right. I I don't think he was right, Don. But I think because he wasn't an English manager, very wrapped up in who the big clubs are, he was able to look out and 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 see. Well, he's a good player. Okay, plays for Charlton. They're a lower half of the of the top division team. I don't care. He's a good player. For he, he, he would go. He would go down into the valley to look for a player. Yeah, <laughs> just take it easy on that one. <laughs> I think you make a really good point, James. Very but quickly. That was good. That was. But that was did, but did was Sven, Sven able to light our fire? Talking See of which. Talking, See what I did there? Yeah, I saw what you did there. <laughs> talking of which, talking about uh, the England lacked fire at the time, James. Let's have a quick look at these charts as well that we've. I think all agreed are pretty shit. There's one or two things that are worth mentioning, but at number one, Light My Fire, Will Young. It's a point to talk about because Will Young, just before this, had been the runner-up in the first series, I think it was, of Pop Idol, you know, when we started doing all these uh, talent shows. And it opened up um, the market, the pop charts at least, for a plethora of these uh, talent show winners and you know um do you know that others. time oh, and that that time i remember reading an interview with a guy who had been eight not stuart adamson but another guy who'd been in big country around that time mm. and uh he'd have re- he'd appeared on top of the pops too or something like that and his kids had seen him but big country hadn't been around for a while you know they were big in the 80s and then um, his daughter looked at him and said, Daddy, are you in a pop group? And she said, yeah. He said, who picked you? <laughs> oh, yeah. The start of those talent oh, hurts. The reemergence of the talent show. I mean, X Factor and Pop Idol weren't new. They were opportunity knocks for music. Celebrities. Um, no, not celebrities. Yeah, there was another one. Opportunity knocks and one more. New faces. New faces. New faces. Yeah, so it was... You know, that was an old format that they brought back and made it purely about music. But that, I mean, musically, it was a massive regression. Absolutely. For me, it was a huge regression when that suddenly became the format. But when you're talking about the charts, I was um, 32, I think, then, or something like that. That was, was No, 36, I think I was, in the year we're talking about. I don't even know. Are you sure old. about that? You're not older than me, are you? Can't be 36, 2002. Oh, no, actually, you, you'd still be a bit younger than me. Yeah. Sorry. 37. I'm 37. I was 37. Yeah, you're a bit younger than me, are you? I don't give a fuck about the charts. <laughs> and I haven't done for years. And I think that but, some, I went through this weird period when all of that talent show music was dominating the charts and all the music appearances on the various entertainment and lifestyle shows. And people I knew in the music industry from my times back on the enemy and They'd be bemoaning it. And I said, what do you give a fuck about the charts? Grow up, it's for teenagers. Well, well, it may be, but it also gives us an insight, doesn't it, into what was happening in the country at the time. Like, we're talking about the the re-emergence of these talent shows. By the way, I did audition for Opportunity Knocks when I was about oh. 11 years old. Do you not New know evidence. this story? New Do you evidence. not know this story? Yeah, no, I'll, no. I'll tell you this story another time. I genuinely did. I didn't get to meet Huey Green. I went to some old church in, um, where were they recording it? Down on the river. Uh, I can't remember what it's called, Down on the river. Uh, not to Teddington a, Lock, Middlesex. Teddington, that was it, Teddington. My Tim's old man drove this, Teddington Lock, Middlesex. My old man drove me. No, he didn't drive me. We didn't have a car, but it took me there. And to got the day off school to go and audition when I was about 11 years old. I did rock around the clock. I didn't really want to do it because I wanted to do Carl Perkins' Honey Don't, which I'd heard on the Beatles album, the fourth Beatles album, I think, Beatles for Sale. I thought, yeah, that's the one that works for me. But we couldn't get the sheet music for it. And in those days, you needed to present the pianist with the sheet music and all of it. So my old man said he went down Tim Pan Alley and then he got 
rock around the clock and say, yeah, do that one. And then he started dressing me up because somewhere between, you know, me bunking off school studies and him realizing I'm going for an audition to opportunity to Knox, pro he probably saw dollar signs and thought, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> let's do it proper now. Have this little paisley shirt, wear that, have this gold medallion. He stuck the gold medallion on me and he said, yeah, when you do go one, two, three o'clock, four o'clock, right? You know, do, he did all the moves for me long, long time ago. Is so this, is this available on, uh, on, media platform thankfully they did have cameras in the church on Taddington Rock. exactly exactly thankfully but i have some sympathy for will young here he's at number one with light my fire but his career has endured james it's not like he was a one-hit wonder one of a lot of those people that come out of the talent shows x factor or pop idol they come with one hit and they can't they struggle yep. to make a second yeah, but uh, Dutton, they're not music stars. They're, they're television stars who sing music on TV. You know, I mean, we're, we're not living in the era when people were selling, you know, like Up the Junction sold a million copies and it never got to number one. You know, that that era that we all lived through in the 60s and the, was certainly in the 70s, um, you know, when when songs were selling millions and millions of, 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 of singles, that period has gone, you know, the... They were they they maintain their fame because the guy can obviously sing. The people that, that the record industry, obviously the music industry, wanted those programs to be a success because they could control the content. The, the you know they could sign the people that got it was free advertising every week. Anybody who signed those those successful you know the 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 acts that got into the that, that maintained their presence throughout the process were getting adverts, peak time adverts every week, and so. It was. A, it wasn't that they were. They were amazing songwriters or anything. None of them was singing their own material. They were picking cover versions. It was like going back to the fifties and the Tommy Steele, Larry Palms era when they, you know, music even up to the early Stones and Beatles when they were given songs to sing, much as you were when you went to Teddington Lock. <laughs> you know. This, <laughs> oh, thank you. I, it, I feel now you've compared me to Tommy Steele. I feel like giving you an edition of. Rock with the Cavemen, or um, he did sing in the blues. He did, did a passable version of singing the b uh, blues as well, not as good as the original. But um, yeah, that era wasn't bad for British music, though, was it? Though James, you know, you talk about Larry Parnes, shillings and pence. We're talking about an era where British music had to compete with America. If you were trying to play music for younger people, had to compete with all the Elvises and everything and still managed to carve a little something out of his own. You know, people still know names like Marty Wilde coming out of that era, Tommy Steele. Billy Fury. Yeah, Billy Fury. You can get, see a statue of him if you go to Liverpool. Jim's keeping very quiet here. You must remember some of this. What, la the, the Larry Parn stable? We're the same age. I, I'm a little bit too... Uh, the, the Up the Junction one, I got, I got that it, one very well. It's that, not that like I is. remember it. Hang on a second. It's not like I remember it. Don't make me sound like the veteran in this, guys. It's not like I remember it, James. It's I've done my research, you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm an old Teddy boy, so... Well, I mean, that period in music, as we started off, it wasn't... You know, if you go back... and You know, I just think about what I was doing professionally at that time. There, there just wasn't a great deal of music that you're thinking, you know, when we started Loaded in 1994, we wanted to put Paul Weller on the cover. Uh, actually, we wanted to put Eric Cantona on the first cover. And you couldn't, this is how football's different now. You know, you, you, you could call, you could get a copy of amazing photograph of Messi or, or you know, any decent player in, in streetwear or his casual wear or training tops. You couldn't get decent photographs of footballers then. And, we wanted to put Eric on the cover. Then we went to Paul Weller. And then the company didn't want us to put Paul Weller on because they thought it would clash with the enemy and Vox and Melody Maker. They thought it would confuse what it was. So, that, But there were multiple choices of every cover of Loaded. Well, I would always have two or three potential cover stars in every issue. And 2002, it was just, it was, Tim is absolutely right. It was not a good time culturally you know as i said the best where were the heirs to oasis and so on where were the people inspired by the likes of oasis where we you know because you know when, when i was growing up you're, you're on an estate you just form a band you know and, and well, i think why did been, that... i think they've been and gone you know i mean the verve certainly changed their look 
when Oasis got good, because I remember seeing the Verve when they were called Verve, and the you know the big Verve album. No, they they were called Verve, were called the Verve, and they had to change the name because the American jazz record label. Um, were they called the Verve or Verve? I thought they were the Verve for me. Okay, we're so not going to argue were, about a definite they, article, are we? <laughs> when they started, Definitely they were called not. Verve, and they were forced to change the name. But I remember going to see them down in a big hall in there. Uh, um, down in South London somewhere and um, the singer had long hair and no shoes on and flares. He had a prayer mat that he danced on, you know? And so then suddenly he's wearing a leather jacket and, and uh, wallabies and, you know, and he's got that kind that's of post Noel look. So, but the, to answer the question, Tim, the bands they influenced, they influenced very quickly and they emerged very quickly. And so, you know, and then also there were other bands there that were, that were, that were going at, the, at longevity, like the Charlatans, the Manics, you know, they were able to support the, the, the uh, Oasis. And I, 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 don't, I, I can't answer your question, but thing, music goes up and down, you know. Noel was writing those songs in the early 90s, and we're now talking about a decade on. And it's, the, you know, that difference is the difference between six and and the Beatles and 1976 and the Sex Pistols it's you know there's huge and there, there is, a decade is an awfully long time even though it's it's not that no, it, 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 back. exactly the same thing happens though in the music business because just the same anecdote that you gave about the verb I remember when um, Boomtown Rats came out it was a shock to us to see photographs of them as like a long-haired hippie pub band in Ireland with Bob Geldof you know beard and long hair and all this sort of stuff because the moment punk blew up everybody decided to cut their hair in a certain way quite short a little bit spiky certainly not combed and to wear you know the odd sort of insignia that references uh, sex or seditionaries down at the end of new uh, uh, King's Road, which was initially Let It Rock, a teddy boy shop as well. So there's a connection there. When you're still you look, lamenting it's lost, aren't you? Yeah, of course I am. Of course I am. But when you look at these charts, the most interesting thing in the top 10 for me was Anton Deck or the Bank of Anton Deck, <laughs> as they should now be called. Uh, we're on the ball. So what do you think they were trying to cash in on in that scenario, Tim? <laughs> they, were, they, were, they were trying to do a three lions, weren't they? And has, has that stuck at all? Now, what well, three um, lines has three lines, oh, three lines, yeah. Clearly, has yeah. the Ant and Deck version? Oh, give me a break, give me a flipping break. <laughs> We're on the ball. Do you really think so? Yeah. No, no, that hasn't stuck. Uh, Liberty X, just a little is at number four. They haven't stuck really. Ronan Keating, I suppose, is around still in one way or another. If tomorrow never comes at number five, Atomic Kitten, well, they've had their moment in the limelight and pretty much gone it's okay by them Enrique Iglesias though with Escape what do you think of that James at number seven Enrique Iglesias does seem yeah. to sort of it's all just to me it's just diarrhea you know it's not <laughs> it's not anything that that you know I I got into writing about music because I was a music fan and, and I, as I said at the top about football about the, the, the passion that, that a, a great moment in a game can have drives in me. I have the same about music. I'm, this is what I'm writing about my, my for my next book at the moment. And so, you know, for I always I, I, in the mid '80s, I was very politically active. I spent a lot of time, you know, uh, at uh, marches for the CND, handing out. We were talking about the racism at Ellen Road. Prior to that, in the early '80s, handing out anti-NF leaflets. And I took, and then there was the minor strike, you know, I'd go to picket lines with my dad. So I took that sense of us and them about the, the establishment and the people I thought were wrong. And I took it from my attitude to music, from my attitude to politics into when I became a music writer. I always thought it was us and them. And them was the major record labels. Didn't strike me that they were also the people that put out you know, the jam records or the clash records or whatever. I just thought there was a mainstream which turning was rebellion shit. into money. Yeah, yeah. That's what they did. They did and, it. Very and there well, was and really there was the independent period. And 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 so that was always my outlook. And then, you know, so when the, you're talking about the charts into I mean, 
you know, I get the charts because it's shit, as we've all agreed. But what about? But there, there are times, Don, when the charts do have the best music in. There have been times, you know, if you, if you used to listen to the, if you listen to uh, the retrospective radio shows where they go through, a, you know, a top ten yeah. in 1968, or you know, or a top ten in 1978, or 1980, or 81. You get these, uh, fanta you get the fantastic records. I, I went well, through the education system. Pardon? Without ever having a teacher who had any, I can't say, yeah, that teacher had an influence on me. It was all like records. It was all like, you know. But that's, that that's the whole saying. point. But that's the whole point that I'm making, though, Tim. Remember earlier on, you said, James, that this music, music in the charts is for teenagers or whatever. But look at those people on the pitch. Look at those players on the pitch. If they're not teenagers, most of them aren't long out of being teenagers. This is the soundtrack to their lives you know these pop records i don't think it was i don't, don't think, think so was. i, I you think don't that, think so no i don't think it was i don't think they were listening to the charts i think they were listening to house music i think you know you're from london you know what it's like putting on the radio uh you you get the right channel going and and, and you've got 16 different uh pirate stations or or legal stations playing house reggae but how many footballers are like that? Be honest now. Well, maybe now. That's what footballers but, listen to a lot. Well, maybe now, maybe now, a lot of that music is as mainstream as any. I mean, grime is mainstream now. Everybody seems to know Stormzy, whether you're a rich person living up in a posh side of town or you're, you know, the gutter snipe or whatever it is. Everybody seems to know who, or a little bit about grime, a little bit about, you know, indie music, a little bit about this. But in those days, I would argue that 18 years ago, 2002, that most of those footballers would have been listening to uh, maybe Eminem, who's number two in the charts. Uh, it's certainly a crap Will song, Young. Isn't it? It's an awful yeah, it might song. Be, it might be, but nevertheless, Ronan Keating and that kind of thing. And, and Holly yeah, Valance. Eminem song it's a it takes Holly Valance at number nine as well, I reckon. And I think it's a mixture. I think, you know, I, I went up around this time and interviewed Rio for the. Times for the front of the Times Saturday magazine, and we were talking. And he was, I said, What'd you go out in Leeds? You know, and he was talking about he loved he, there was a house in Hare Hills, which is where my part where my dad lives in Hare Hills. He was just talking about this house around the corner from my dad's where he would go uh, and get you know the, 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 the food that his, that his mum had made him growing up, that you know, the, the West Indian food. And the you know, and I, I don't think people who would kids who had grown up listening to urban music hip hop, house music. I don't think they suddenly stopped and became no. interested in the charts, but I think there are lots of bland footballers <laughs> who spend Sunday at B&Q. I, I didn't want to say. You know, and I think there are lots of footballers who like very mainstream music, but I think particularly the guys that grew up in the inner cities of the big cities were, were probably not going anywhere near the charts. They were listening mm. to club music and house music and, and hip hop. Well, so maybe drum and bass. I don't know if drum and bass had started by then, but you know that, that wouldn't the, have been true a few years earlier. I think that that's something that around this time starts to apply to some of the footballers. But the fo the footballers a few years earlier, I think they were unbelievably mainstream. I remember well, I used to buy shoot, I mean, used to buy shoot magazine, and they used to do this focus. It's actually where I went. I learned the word miscellaneous because they had to fill in miscellaneous likes and miscellaneous dislikes. What, what does that mean? So, you know, you go to the dictionary and you find out what miscellaneous means. But it, it, one of the questions was favourite music. And I'm, I'm talking here, this is kind of late 70s, when there was so much great stuff going on. They all liked, like, Jackson Brown. Lionel like, what, what, what's the matter with you? I remember well, being at Watford once, and the PA announcer, that they, they were doing a thing where they were uh, a player could pick a record before the game. Uh, and uh, it was one of the big centre backs, and he'd chosen all along the Watchtower, you know, Jim, the Jimi Hendrix version of all along the Watchtower. And the the, the, the stadium PA, so he, he made a big thing of this, you know. Yeah, we've got something. A player, he's 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 done. He's he's chosen something really off the wall this time, you know. Because <laughs> usually it would be, I don't know. No, uh, I mean, I think it just comes down to this. Lots of people who don't really know what footballers' lives are like, make generalisations. I mean, I just made them say, I made a generalisation saying I thought there were lots of footballers who liked cool music and underground music, but I actually, and, and, and you know, club music. But I think they're just, it's such a broad spread. If you went into any workplace and, and picked out 30 employees, even employees which were very tight-knit, 
group as players are, you, you'd have people with all sorts of different tastes. I mean, I 100%, know hundred percent, hundred percent. And that was always the case, but yeah. I'm saying, um, I, I think you're hundred percent right, James, but I'm saying, yes, it was the case. And particularly if you lived a, relatively not exclusively because I know a lot of people in rural areas who were down with music much more than I was the kind of music I was listening to but I'm saying that's much more of a cosmopolitan experience if you're around a group of people who happen to all form bands or all be punks invariably you get sort of drawn into that as well you become no, part I'm, of that. I'm remembering now I'm remembering seeing do you remember the mint juleps yeah of course yeah yeah they, they did great. kind of a doo-wop thing didn't they for a while yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, were they I just saw, all girls or something? Yeah, all girls. girls? Yeah, it was yeah, an East, right. East London band, I think. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, and I, I, this is kind of mid eighties, uh, and uh, they were on tour. I can't remember who they were supporting, but they were on tour. Uh, and uh, they, they said, um, "This audience." They said, "Have you ever heard of Lovers Rock?" <laughs> and obviously everyone said, "Yeah." And, <laughs> and they said, "Yeah," because we just did a gig at Portsmouth, and no one had heard of it then. And yeah. then they launched into "I'm So Sorry." I wonder who oh, did the original of that. Well, yeah, I'm so sorry that they you know had to launch into it. I remember the story from this period. I mean, I've been to lots of gigs where there've been footballers and I've met a lot of footballers at clubs that are about music clubs, not just going out and meeting girls and drinking or whatever. But when Gaza was at Everton, um, I used to know Scott Gemmell, Archie's son, who was a yeah. midfielder alongside Gaza and I also knew Noah Whelan, who's on Radio Leeds mm -hmm. now, he's a great commentator. And Noel and he was at Nottingham Forest, I think at the time, or Coventry or somewhere. And um, they rang up and they said, you, uh, Scott rang up and said, can you get tickets for, for Oasis in Watford? I went, yeah, uh, probably. Yeah, we could probably go and see that. And then he said, OK. He said, um, all right, it's me, Gazza and Noel. I went, OK, so he rang up and I said, look, it's James Brown from the magazines and Gazza and... and uh, the um and Scott and Noel there was about three or four of us going anyway Gaza couldn't come so we got there and they weren't going to let us in because you didn't well, have Gaza with the you ben, they were so excited about Gaza coming <laughs> to the Oasis but they wouldn't they wouldn't let us come in even though that like you know it was like I we would have if we hadn't had Gaza's name on the list we would have got in anyway um but I just you know and I think that's I've been to so many different clubs and seen players in there from the house era through to the you know the music the, the, the live bands and um i just feel for them if, if they're listening to like the remains of westlife uh in that period that we're talking about and you're picking Maybe them up as, as the better player the better music you know hip-hop was still massive then you know you mentioned eminem yeah, no, I don't uh, think and and a, a lot of people, you know, contemporarily or over the last twenty years, were listening to things like house, like you said, listening to garage music, two step, all of this sort of stuff as well. So let's not be, as you say, um, you know, let's not uh, stereotype footballers entirely. Look, we've got to wrap up, guys. Uh, this has been a fascinating conversation because we concluded that the music in the charts was shit, although there was some decent music around that weren't in the top 10. We've concluded that it was a pretty shitty average kind of England team at the time, even though they beat Argentina 1-0. Is there anything else that we conclude we can conclude with that was shit? From yeah, well, no, I t from my point of view, the matches were on in that World Cup far too early. Oh, oh yeah. I you, don't, you don't know how lucky you are. It was four hours <laughs> earlier for me. <laughs> no, but that's better. That's two o'clock in the morning. That's the end of the night. I remember getting. I remember getting up. I remember leaving somewhere to go to my mate, my mate's house. He said, "Let's watch the game. Come over." I could have just watched. Morning. This is England Brazil. I think it was a Thursday or a Friday morning. It was. A I remember that. I remember that. It was a beautiful sunny morning. It was, you know, kickoff was six a.m. I got over, I drove across London to hang out with my mate who I like watching football with. I could have just watched it at home. And he's he's met a woman the night before and he's in bed with her. I've only got in at like <laughs> one o'clock and he just came out in his pants, half asleep, opened the door, let me in, turned the telly on and went back to bed. I had to, <laughs> to sit in this flat. I had to stay in a beautiful house. I could have been watching the game. I was in this little flat. 
We didn't have any food or drinking. It was, we got knocked out. That is my memory of that World Cup. You see, I knew that we'd end with a really shitty night, at least. Thank you very much for very skillfully tying up all the shit that people endured, uh, particularly on the 7th of June 2002, when England met Argentina in the World Cup. Uh, James, it's a pleasure. You haven't told us about this five-a-side book that you've got out there. Well, uh, it came out a few years ago. It's called Above Head Height. And if you've ever played five-a-side, pick it up. I mean, uh it, it was based on an article I did about a friend who organised our game that went properly viral on social media. And um, it's full of anecdotes from all sorts of different amateur players about different elements of five side from kit to pitches to team names to what you feel when you're playing. And uh, it's still there. Funnily, funnily enough, during lockdown, I started to get a lot of messages again from people saying they'd bought it or they'd finally got around reading it. I mean, it, you know, it's kind of uh, sold about 10,000 copies. It's got a nice green cover. And, um, you know, people are able to play football outside again at the moment. So it might be a chance to, to read about it when we head back into lockdown. Hey, the great thing is people are able to put, play football five aside with the requisite amount, maximum amount of people that you can play five aside or to play football with. Six is the maximum at the moment. Anyway, my, uh, thanks very much, James and Tim as well. Really appreciate it. Uh, let's reconvene next time.